If others follow Joe Johnson's lead, there will be no deal. Parliament will reject it, leaving the country facing either no deal, a prospect he says in a long article would be disastrous, or he hopes a second referendum on our membership of the EU. Joe Johnson joins us in the studio. Good morning to you. Good morning. Eric. You are resigning in protest at a deal that hasn't been done yet. Why now? Well, we are clearly in the final stages of finalising this deal across Whitehall and in Brussels. And it looks uh, from the signs of things as though MPs and Parliament as a whole will be asked to take a view very shortly. And I'm anticipating that the full weight of the government machine will soon kick into action to push through the deal that's uh, close to being finalised, which itself is based, uh, we understand, on the white paper that was put forward in the summer known as the Chequers Arrangement. Now, you've been in the Transport Ministry for a few months dealing with the consequences of no deal. Is it partly looking at that, looking at those plans that led you to the conclusion that you had to get out and try and stop Brexit? Yes, I'm deeply concerned that this isn't really a choice at all. We're being presented with two options, vassalage on the one hand via the deal that the Prime Minister is now finalising in Brussels, which will leave us subject to EU rules over huge swathes of our economy whilst giving us no say in how they're formed on the one hand. And then on the other hand, no deal at all and crashing out on WTO terms, which, as you say, um, I've seen uh, in my time at the Department for Transport is going to be really problematic for our country. It's going to be desperately difficult for manufacturers who have these just-in-time supply chains. Reduced capacity at our key cross-channel ports, Dover Calais routes, is going to be massively difficult for um, firms. We are going to see Kent, the Garden of England, turned into a lorry park. We're going to see the M20 uh, in that scenario used as a queuing area for heavy goods vehicles, all the way up to the M25, bordering my own constituency in Orpington. This is not what the public voted for. Let's be clear. You have sat at a ministerial desk, at a departmental desk, and you have seen plans that you believe will turn Kent into a car park and also disrupt the supply of food and disrupt, disrupt the supply of medicines. Well, it's, it's no secret that the government is making elaborate operations, uh, Operation Brock, uh, as it's known, Operation Stack, its predecessor, to cater for the eventuality of severe disruption at our... Uh, key uh, channel ports, principally Dover, Folkestone and so on. And those arrangements will see these key arteries, the M20 and the M26, which, as I said, goes all the way up to the M25 next to my constituency on the edge of London, turned into a curing area for heavy goods vehicles, causing immense disruption to my constituents. And that's in a no-deal scenario. And that's why I don't think this is a reasonable choice for the Prime Minister to present the country with. Why on earth make no-deal... An option then, because in a sense your resignation undermines Theresa May when she's in the final days of trying to do a negotiation. It makes the chances of her getting any deal through Parliament less. It therefore makes the chances of no deal precisely the horror that you have spelt out much more likely, doesn't it? We need to pause and take stock. This isn't a real choice at all. It's not a choice for the country to be asked to choose between vassalage on the one hand, no say over huge swathes of our economy, and crashing out on the other. We need to look at the alternative. Well, let's, let's look, first of all, at the deal and why you criticise it. We will come to what you can do as another alternative. You say that uh, the draft deal that we've got is worse than staying in the EU. Well, that's the language of the former Foreign Secretary. Uh, yeah, indeed, you're echoing your brother, in other words. And you say that you are united in fraternal dismay, as you put it. Why? Well, it is uh, certainly worse than our current arrangements, and it's you know, striking, I think that the most prominent leaders of the Leave campaign are themselves of that view. But frankly, it's not very difficult to see why. Because when you look at this deal and you compare it to the promises that were made during the referendum campaign, the deal falls spectacularly short. We were promised greater sovereignty. Well, we're not going to get greater sovereignty. We're going to cede sovereignty. We're going to lose control over how 
rules affecting swathes of our economy are shaped. It's not the British Parliament that's going to gain control from this. It's the French Parliament, the German Parliament, and the European Parliament, certainly not our own. We're but going you, to lose sovereignty. So that's one respect in which this deal falls through. Yeah, you go on and then say that there'll be a boundless transition in the long piece that you've written, what you call never-ending purgatory. They're all nice yeah, phrases, but, 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 but where's the evidence for it? But before we come on to that, the deal falls short in other respects too. We were promised that Brexit would deliver and a capacity for us to strike trade deals around the world. Well, the deal that's on offer will severely restrict our ability to do meaningful trade deals. We were promised in the referendum campaign that Brexit was going to enable us to become a turbocharged Southeast Asian style Singaporean low tax dynamic economy off, off, the continental, off continental Europe. Far from it. We're signing up to this common rule book which will keep us bound to exactly the same rules and regulations as the rest of the European Union. So what was billed is very, very different from what was being uh, what, from what is now being delivered in the deal. And I think it's absolutely vital in this, in this situation that we go back to the people and say, is this actually the Brexit that you want? Do you want to leave the European Union on this basis? We'll come to the terms of any second referendum that you want to, in a little while. But you have raised your brother. I did not raise him, the former Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson. You use phrases. Uh, either that are direct quotes from him or indeed sound very similar. You talk of vassalage, you talk of uniting in fraternal dismay. There will be some people who hear me say, ah, Joe Johnson's very different. Uh, he's a Remainer, he's low-key, Boris is flamboyant and he's a, a lever. And they'll say, they sound very similar to me. They are posh boys playing games with Britain's future. And we've had enough of it. Well, the, the point I'm making is that I don't want to play games. I want to give the people a proper choice. It's not a second referendum. It's actually a first referendum that's based on the realities of the deal that's now on offer. It's not based on an idealised Brexit that people might have fantasised about during the referendum campaign. It's about the reality of what we've been able to negotiate as an economy with the European Union. Let, I want the first referendum on that question. You wrote the Conservative Manifesto in 2015. And I'll quote it. We will honour the result, whatever the outcome. Did you not mean that when you wrote it? Or did you just not think about the words? Well, I'm very proud of the, of the part I played in producing uh, that manifesto. It won us, the Conservative Party, the first majority in almost a quarter of a century. So why are you going to break the promise? many uh, progressive, modernising, socially liberal policies have enabled us to reach beyond our core base. Sure, win but that. why break a promise that you wrote? We're not breaking that promise. First of all, we held the referendum that we committed to hold, and we held it, as you know, in June 2016. And since then, in the following two years, we have been implementing that result. And the Prime Minister is about to come back to Parliament with the deal that she's negotiated. It's now up to Parliament to decide what to do with that deal. So well, I would say me, you're, you're so playing with words, aren't you? No, I, mean, I would it, say no, We will honour the result, whatever the outcome means, that people well, vote to leave, that you will honour the decision to leave. That's precisely and what you're saying what we've is, let's we've tear it up. We've been implementing the referendum result. The Prime Minister has been negotiating the terms of our exit from the European Union. They are, in my view, and in the view of others, so radically different from the Brexit that was built during the referendum that I think it would be a democratic travesty if we did not go back to the people and seek their consent for our departure on, from the EU on this basis. So different, you say, from what was billed during the referendum. So different, you say, from what was the idealised Brexit. I have to point out, there's one person that did that, your brother. Boris Johnson told us what it would be. What you're saying is, I think he was appeared to be saying, is he lied, he got us to vote for leave, and he had no plan for getting out. Look, I mean, in, in the campaign, there were undoubtedly uh, promises made that have shown to be undeliverable. No one can dispute that. We were promised a Brexit that would enable us to strike trade deals around the world. We are far from that with the deal that the Prime Minister is going to produce. We were promised a Brexit that was going to unleash our economy as a sort of a low-tax Singaporean tiger on the edge of Europe. On the contrary, we're signing up to all the rules and regulations that bind the rest of the EU. Is that an elegant and, and way of saying that we were lied to? And, we've, and we're going to end is up it an ceding, elegant way of saying we were, we're lied going to? to end up ceding sovereignty, not taking back control. Well, look, it was a false prospectus. It was a fantasy set of promises that have been shown up for what they were. We're now faced with the reality of that in the form of the deal the Prime Minister is about to bring back before Parliament. My view is that this is so different from what was billed that it will be an absolute travesty if we don't go back to the people and ask them if they actually do want to 
to exit the EU on this extraordinarily hopeless basis. Talk us through how we get from where we are to where you want us to be. Theresa May has said it again and again, Downing Street said it on her behalf last night, there will be no second referendum. The man who effectively is the referee of the rules in the House of Commons, the clerk to the Commons says, you can vote for what you like, but it will not force the government to give the country another referendum. So isn't your recipe really well, for a coup against the Prime Minister? Leaving that to one side for a second, I'll come back to it. The, the government policy is always government policy until it isn't. And, you know, you remember what the Prime Minister was saying about holding a, a, another general election in 2017. There was absolutely no plan. It was against the national interest to hold a general election. And then suddenly we were holding a general election. So government policy changes when it changes. And up until then, it's not government policy. She might but, change her mind. But if she doesn't, of course, the other obvious option, if Parliament does what you want it to do, which is defeat this deal, is change the Prime Minister. That's certainly not what I'm seeking to achieve uh, with my resignation. What I'm seeking but it to may achieve be with my but resignation it may be necessary. But is, it may to, be necessary. is to urge people to pause and reflect on other options that we have before us than the two that the government is going to put on the table. The yeah. government is going to put on the table, Nick, vassalage on the one hand through this you, deal. You, you've, you've said that, forgive me. chaos of no deal on the other, and I think but that's unacceptable. Let me, let me just return to your position on the Prime Minister. You say you're not trying to uh, uh, remove her and not trying to organise a coup. You do accuse her of the worst example of statecraft since Suez. It's not exactly overwhelming support for her premiership. This is a difficult negotiation, and the product of it is deeply unsatisfactory. We're left with this unfortunate choice, which is clearly going to be unacceptable. There are better options available for us. I want us to pause okay. as a parliament and, and as a country well, to let, take stock of what let, they are. Let's just do a quick fire round, if we may, uh, of some of the options. Uh, would we be better off with a Canada trade deal? advocated by one Boris well, look, Johnson than a, with the current deal. This is not a parlour game where we fantasise about different options that we might uh, imagine are available. What we know is available is what the Prime Minister is going to bring back to the table in Parliament in the coming Just so I'm clear what you're saying. Yeah, you're not criticising my parlour game, you're criticising the Canada option as not yeah, being available. We can talk about these uh, other potential ways of doing Brexit, EEA, Canada plus plus plus, but the fact is we've got something concrete now on the table to evaluate that the Prime Minister is about to bring back to Parliament. Okay. I think it's the time for us to compare that to the promises that were made and see the massive gulf that's emerged and whether the public really wants to exit the EU on that basis. Would we be better off with Boris Johnson in Downing Street than Theresa May? There isn't a leadership uh, vacancy in the Conservative Party. And what I about Joe Minister Johnson in Downing Street instead of Theresa May? Because some people think that's what this is about. Obviously, I'm not giving that a second thought. But, I mean, my, my priority, Nick, is really just to do my bit as a now backbench MP um, to try and encourage the country to pause and reflect before we do something that's irrevocably stupid. This was a decision that obviously took you some time. Have you been talking to other ministers? Do you think there are other people examining their consciences in the way that you are? Yes, of course I talk to colleagues across Parliament and um, those conversations always remind me of how deeply um, MPs think about their responsibilities and I know many are reflecting hard about uh, the deal that's, that's looming and how they will respond to it, but it's obviously for each of them to work out how best to respond to those questions. Well, I've been around at Westminster a long time, you've been around politics. Let's see if we share the analysis. I wouldn't be at all surprised if there were other ministerial resignations in the coming days. Well, that's for you to judge. You're, What's your judgment? You're better placed than me, potentially. I mean, it's for each MP to come to his or her own own view. You I think, think they're these made are very, very difficult decisions. This is one of the most momentous questions we will ever face in our political careers, and everybody is thinking very hard about it. Let me not ask you to judge, but to recommend. You've decided, and it may end your career rather than make it, to resign, would you urge other ministers to do well, the same? I've happily taken the decision to end my ministerial career. Um, I think this is so important that it's up to MPs to take a stand. I've done so. If others feel that it's right for them to do so, good on them. Joe Johnson, thank you for coming in.